Hello class, today we're going to talk about factors of safety and connection design. All right, learning objectives for this chapter. Uh, we want to, I want everybody to be able to explain why we apply factors of safety. Why are these important? We're going to talk about a design methodology called allowable stress design. So be able to describe what it means to use allowable stress. Uh, I want you to be able to talk about how to design and size connections using allowable stress design. And then we're going to talk a little bit about methodology of load factor, uh, load and resistance factor design. This is the kind of the more modern standard that we're using more and more as we uh, have more test data about these different materials that we're using. All right, let's take a look at a connection design application. This is a great example of a very common design application in steel framing. Um, in this case, we have a splice between two columns, the column below and the column above. And we want to figure out what are the, if we know the loads that are coming down from this column above, how do we determine the right amount of bolts and size of bolts to splice these parts together? Um, and most important, and another thought, just a, 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 a thing to think about is why do we even want the splice? And uh, this might be not something that's readily apparent to you, but as a designer, um, I had to think about what are, where are the loads actually being, or where, how does this thing actually get to site, right? The reality is that we can't ship a whole building in one piece to the site. Usually it's uh, coming in a lot of different pieces. So if we have a column that needs to be eventually 100 feet tall, that doesn't fit on a truck. So we have to have a splice just from um, basic uh, shipping concerns. Also, um, there's a kind of a limit on how tall we want this to stand up without building the floors in between, right? The floors hold all these columns together in the right place, in the right orientation. So by building it in smaller sections, we have a little bit more stability during construction. We can also use a splice to change uh, column sizes, right? If we have a, uh, as we go tall, higher up the building, there's actually less and less load in the column, right? As we get towards the bottom, we're seeing more of the weight uh, cascading down, right? So at the bottom of the building, we're going to see really big, beefy columns. And at the top of the building, we're going to see small, uh, thin columns. So it helps us transition between different sizes. Um, so those are some many of the reasons why we'd want to splice. How do we actually design these splices? Well, that's where allowable stress kind of comes in. So we're going to talk about what is allowable stress, what purpose does it serve? And why don't we just load it all the way to the max? Like we're, we've got test data, like let's just take it all the way to the max. All right, so a big reason for allowable stress is safety, right? As a structural engineer designing buildings, that was a really big concern, but even for smaller things, um, we wanna make sure that it's safe, right? A small, uh, mechanical products can hurt people if they fail, even if they're small, right? If a chair breaks, somebody might get injured, um, and then the uh, company that built the chair could be liable. So we wanna make sure that everything's safe, and we wanna make sure that it's less than the load that the member could fully support. Why is it so important? Well, the reality is, is as, as accurate as we try to be, geometry, what actually gets designed and what gets built are often two different things. Um, there's also people use things in unexpected ways, uh, especially for buildings, right? You might see something get changed later down the line into a different purpose. It's got a totally different loading that we didn't expect. Um, materials actually deteriorate with time. Older buildings, you can see uh, just materials start to fail over time or some uh, uh, water can get in and weaken materials. So you want to make sure that you're kind of designing for the long term. And a big one that we notice, especially with woods and things like that, uh, grown organic uh, materials, is that there's some big variances in the material properties. Um, one tree could be much stronger than another tree. And before you know it, now our floor beams have different strengths overall. So we want to build a little factor of safety just in case our materials aren't as strong as we predict them to be. All right, so how does factor safety work and how do we calculate it? This is uh, probably the most common way that we calculate factor safety. We think about this as 
what is the uh, force that's going to cause the material to yield versus uh, the force that we're allowing that's going to give us a factor of safety. And this factor, uh, actually, we've got this backwards. All right, so how do we calculate this factor of safety? Factor of safety is founded, uh, well, we basically find it by using, comparing what's the yielding strength of the material versus the allowable stress that we're going to, uh, that we're going to design for. Um, this yielding material is basically based on material uh, permanent deformation. We're going to talk more about this in detail later, but if you bend something, oftentimes you can bend it right back. Uh, it'll bend back on its own once you release the force. So before you do that, I bend this, I release it, it goes back to its original shape. But, so if I, if I don't bend it too far, if I don't apply too much force, I won't see permanent damage or permanent yielding of the material. This is the most common way to design things is to think about that yielding strength. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we select these factors of safety later, but this is how we would calculate the factor of safety. All right. So, uh, to give you a little context here, if we're looking at this, if I walked into this building and I asked you, did this, did this beam fail? And you're looking at it and you're like, hey, it's in one piece, didn't fail, right? Technically, we could think of this as not failing, right? It did not break, it did not fail in strength. There might actually be some more strength in that beam left, even at that, under those extreme conditions that caused this severe bending. But at the end of the day, I would not feel safe in that building. And I know lots of people that wouldn't, right? And if you built a building and it looks like that when you were done, you're probably gonna get some very expensive phone calls uh, and there's gonna be lawyers involved, right? Now this is an extreme case. This is actually not caused by an overload of the beam here. Um, this is actually uh, fire testing. Um, they did some testing after the 9-11 attack to figure out what is the effect of high temperatures on steel? And this is what happens. They don't actually uh, melt, right? Those beams are still in one general piece, but they definitely soften. And that softening can cause failure over time. Um, well, it can cause a very fast failure when you have extreme heat over a very tall building. So I'm sorry for you spare changers in the crowd. Um, this was not an inside job. Burning jet fuel in a building, even if it's not enough to melt the steel, is enough to soften it and cause severe and ca cause catastrophic structural failure. All right, why do we pick yielding as a failure mode? And that was a kind of a great example of an application of that. Well, the big thing is we want that extra reserve strength, right? Even if I if I design it to yield as my failure thing, there's actually a little bit more strength past yielding. Um, and that yielding is a pretty big, usually a very large deformation when we're dealing with a lot of steels and other typical uh, engineering uh, materials that we use. Um, another big thing is if we see a large deformation, it's gonna ruin a mechanism, right? If this is part of a very precise uh, mechanism, if the, the rod bends too much or the gears bend too much, that's a failure, right? The gear no longer works as intended and it's gonna cause internal collision. This is a very uh, common case in engine failure, right? If we see uh, overheating, overheating can cause those materials to, to uh, bend in ways that they're not supposed to and cause a catastrophic internal collision and wreck your engine. Alternatively, this is the other way to calculate factor of safety. This is not as commonly used um, but this is a case where we're seeing, let's go to absolute failure. So instead of having yielding up here, we put the failure strength of the material or the ultimate strength. Um, sometimes we call it ultimate or absolute failure. That means that this thing breaks, right? Or we start to see significant uh, shredding of the cross section. Um, this is found by testing. Um, and in this case, this factor of safety, like before, it's based on experience with similar conditions and similar types of load cases. 
All right, why would we pick this absolute failure as a failure mode? Um, this is pretty common with brittle components. If we have something like a high strength cable, um, it's going to break before it, it's gonna yield and then break soon afterwards. Um, the deformations in that case don't matter as much because you're not gonna see the deformation of that high strength cable before it breaks. Um, and typically when we're using this sort of thing, it's something where we have very extremely detailed analysis or testing to ensure safe operation up to that uh, total failure. Um, like, what, like for instance, what we have with uh, tension cables. It's very easy to test tension cables. It's a very common test and they are extremely well uh, manufactured and designed in order in such a way that they're very predictable strengths. All right, so let's talk about uh, stress versus force in these factor of safety. So the factor of safety we looked at before were all based on um, stress, or sorry, based on force. We can actually interpret these in terms of stress. Right? If we are saying that there's a proportional relationship between stress and force, and there is, we know that proportional relationship. That proportional relationship is just saying, hey, uh, force is stress times area. Area is constant, so it's a very proportional relationship. We know that, so we can say, hey, if these areas are the same, which will, they will be uh, often for failure and allowable stress, we can say, hey, let's just compare stresses. Um, and some ways that makes it a lot easier to compare. And oftentimes uh, for materials, it's based on material stress and, mater uh, and, and not so much on the size of the material that itself. So it's more often that we're gonna use these sorts of stress formulas. So you could use um, stress failure or stress um, yielding. Uh, this is sigma stress or normal stress. And this is tau, which remember is shear stress. So we could do those comparisons instead of using force directly. That's going to make it applicable for small parts and also large parts um, based on, and, and it will be intrinsically based on the material instead of that particular part, which gives us a lot more flexibility in applying these formulas. The other way to think about this is a relationship between capacity and demand. And I actually got this part backwards. Let me stop the video here and fix that. All right, now that we've got this sorted out correctly, we're saying over here, factor of safety is actually gonna be capacity over demand. We always want this to be bigger than one. Um, so if we had more capacity uh, than demand, that would be safe, right? So that's what we want. Um, this is often thought of, uh, in this particular case, in terms of strength and load, we often use factors of safety also when we design things, uh, if you get into civil engineering, like um, uh, roadways or uh, pump design, this, this same idea of capacity over demand can be taken into other cases as well. Um, so you'll see factors of safety in those sorts of fields as well. All right, so what are typical values for factor of safety? The big one that we always have to make sure that we're uh, avoiding is we've got to have this factor of safety be greater than one to avoid failure, right? We want that capacity to be greater than the demand. Um, but for some cases, we can get closer to one. If we're looking at an airplane, we want that factor of safety to be as close to one as we feel comfortable doing. Um, remember that every time we save weight, we have less mass and that's going to be less fuel. Uh, and as sorts of things where, you know, adding winglets that, that change the amount of drag fuel efficiency by like 3%, they've spent, uh, Boeing had people upgrade their uh, Boeing 737s. I think there were like a $2 million uh, cost and every airline had them almost instantaneously because every flight that adds up over hours and hours of flight time. Um, for other cases where we have high risk, like nuclear power plants, we really want a big factor of safety. If a nuclear power plant has a failure, that is bad news. There's lots of people involved, lots of people affected by that. So if we have increased uncertainty or risk, we want a bigger factor of safety. What are some reasons to uh, that would negatively affect or use it? Well, be careful. A uh, negatively affect our factor of safety. Right? Why would we use a higher value? 
Um, sometimes that's based on uh, variable material strengths. It might be some proportion of the load changing. Um, warehouses are a great case for this, right? We have a lot of product moving in and out. Um, it's moving around. It's not equalized necessarily. Um, if we have a load that's removed and replaced or something that's bent one way and then bent the other way, that would be a reverse loading. Um, this is also the case for bridges, right? If we have a dynamic load or something like that where the load is, is being loaded and unloaded or loaded in one span and then loaded in the next span, those are gonna cause kind of a cyclical loading that's gonna cause failure over time. Uh, impact loads are big, right? Sometimes uh, vehicles can hit things and those are very uh, harder to predict sometimes. Um, in a case where we have a complex or difficult case, if we just wanna get an idea of stress for analysis, we'll use a high factor of safety for our initial design and maybe go back and refine that model later if we need a smaller or a less costly solution. And like I said, any kind, we have a high danger or risk to human life. So this could be somewhere that's very risky, like a nuclear power plant, or it could be something that's very critical. Um, fire stations and police stations and um, hospitals are great examples of places where the risk to human life or the, the risk of those situations, uh, those buildings being down uh, could be very uh, catastrophic. All right, so, Let's stop there.